Ee, hocam. Söyle söyle. Ee, sizden izin gerekiyor. Aa doğru pardon. Dur bir dakika. Senin de şey yapmam lazım. Tamam senin de co-host yaptım. Bastım mı rekorda? Tamam. Uh, okay. Uh, welcome to Higher Structures uh, Seminars of Feza Gürsey Center of Physics and Mathematics. And this is the first seminar of the year 2023. I hope 2023 will be a good year for uh, globally, let me say, hopefully. Uh, and today our speaker is Neslihan Gügümcü from Izmir Institute of Technology. And she will talk on quantum invariant of multi-notoids. So welcome, Nesihan. So Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this invitation. It's really important, I guess, uh, to organize um, seminars under the name of Feza Gürsey. Uh, I hope the Institute will be open soon. And thanks for the good wishes. So let's say 2023 will be the opening of the Institute, maybe. I don't know. Let's uh, make a wish. So today I'm going to talk about um, notoids, multi-notoids, our linkoids, um, some generalizations of notoids, and uh, I will construct, I will show you a construction of a quantum invariant uh, of multi-notoids. And I will show you more actually, I mean, we have an ongoing project with Lou Kaufman. So I will give you hints of this work also mixed with this uh, past work. So let's proceed with the definition of a notoid. So a notoid is just an immersed arc in a plane or in a general surface of some genus G, orientable or non-orientable, there is no restriction on it. So we have some pictures of notoid diagrams here drawn in the plane, or you can consider them in the uh, two sphere. Um, but I mean, they are co defined combinatorially in the two dimensional spaces, not in the three dimensional space like classical knots. So what we want uh, from this immersion, uh, it should be a generic immersion that is, um, it should have a finite number of singularities that are transversal intersection points, as we see from these pictures. They are just finite domain intersections that we endow with over or under information. We impose this information as an extra. And we want uh, the images of the points zero and one to be distinct points in the plane or in the surface that do not intersect any of the crossings or each other. And so they, I mean, it should be an open arc, uh, the um, image of this map, K. Okay? And uh, we just assume an orientation from the image of zero to the image of one. So this is the convention for the orientation. We can forget about orientation sometimes, but um, generally we assume this uh, orientation choice. Uh, and from these pictures, we see two types of notoid diagrams. In the first type, on the left-hand side, we see a notoid diagram with two endpoints in, that lie in the same region of the, uh, of the plane or diagram. Uh, by region, I mean that if you consider this as a graph, by forgetting about the uh, crossing information and considering the intersections as vertices, uh, this graph is just uh, dividing the plane into some finite number of regions, and each a uh, face is called the region of the diagram. And in the first picture, we see two of the endpoints are just in the same face and in the exterior face or unbounded face of the uh, plane uh, or, um, or the sphere. Um, and in the second picture, we see some uh, distance between the endpoints. Actually, they lie in different faces of the underlying graph of this uh, diagram. And to close this diagram by embedded arc, we need to create some more crossings. Or in other words, if you consider a classical knot uh, as an mm, immersed circle to turn these diagrams into a knot diagram, we need to close the endpoints with an uh, embedded arc. And in the first picture, we have we don't need to create any crossings, but in the second picture, there are some crossings to be uh, created. So this is the point where notoid theory that was introduced by Tribe, Vladimir Tribe, that is who is in Indiana University right now. Uh, just recently, 2012, it's not very past, uh, but um, actually when we consider the endpoints in the same region of the surface or, uh, or the plane, uh, this theory 
just falls back to the theory of one one tangles or long knots or classical knot theory. But the extension or the generaliz generalization of the theory, classical knot theory, starts by the assumption that endpoints can lie in different phases in different regions. And it gives us some extra structures or extra invariants or some invariants that are non trivial for classical knots, but uh, sorry, that are trivial for classical knots, but non trivial for notoids, notoid, uh, these proper diagrams that have distance between the endpoints. So too much talking on the definition, but that's important. So in the end, uh, on the left-hand side, we can consider that this diagram is just a representation of a knot, of a classical knot in the plane with two endpoints, um, distinct endpoints. I mean, we can just cut out a usual or um, a strand that do not contain any crossings from a knot diagram to obtain this di uh, diagram. And um, properties or the invariants will be coinciding with the classical knot invariants or the same values uh, with the corresponding knot when we close it. But on the right-hand side, we see a, a different structure than a classical knot, even though it's a classical knot diagram with some distance between the endpoints. So as I said, uh, it is just an extension of the classical knot theory. Uh, and in this extension, we assume the rider meister moves to create an equivalence relation. Uh, on the on our notary diagrams that lie in a surface. So these uh, rider meister moves are uh, these three moves uh, that changes the diagram combinatorics uh, in the shown way, uh, like we as we see in the picture. Uh, so for example, the first move can delete or add a, a crossing by creating a king, or uh, if there is a coincidence uh, of two crossings uh, that has the same. Uh, passage information, we can just fall, uh, take apart these strands um, distant and or we can just uh, pass one strand uh, above or under another one. And the third move is the triangular move. If we have such a coincidence of three strands of a diagram, uh, we can change uh, or we can just pull uh, one of the strands that lies under everything here just uh, across the crossing. Or we have other versions of these moves uh, that we obtain uh, by changing the crossing information, by making the underpassing, for example, over, etc. So we assume the rider meister moves to have an equivalence relation on notoid diagrams, and what we call a notoid will be an equivalence class uh, of all equivalent notoid diagrams that lies in the same surface, sigma. And we just forbid these two moves, that is uh, to pass or pull or uh, push an endpoint across a um, strand. Um, I mean, it is always uh, the reason is always why we don't want these moves because if you just allow these two moves, we can undo any notary diagram like we uh, like our shoelaces, right? So we forbid these uh, two moves and we assume these three local moves to um, obtain some equivalence on the set of uh, notary diagrams lying in some surface sigma. We can, of course, gener extend uh, or generalize uh, this concept to multi-linkoids that have more components. Uh, and some of the components may be closed components or not components, or uh, and some of the components may be open components that are just immersed arcs in some surface. We see here uh, a multi-linkoid with three components. One of them uh, is the unknot here. Uh, just a trivial circle component, and uh, two components are just open components lying in the torus. Um, so should I say something more here? Yeah, I mean, we we also assume um, rider meister moves for multi-linkoids to, um, to induce an equivalence relation on them. We always consider topological structures, topological uh, objects up to some relation, and rider meister moves are giving us this uh, relation for us. Any questions up to now? Okay. All right. So as I said in the beginning, in the first slide, uh, there's a very close relation uh, between notoids and classical knots and also virtual knots. In the above picture, we see two types of classical closures of the same notoid diagram. We can just uh, declare that our embedded arc, uh, the chosen embedded arc that will connect endpoints will go under everything that it meets during the closure. Here it meets just one strand and it goes under it. The red arc is the connection arc. And what we create is a trefoil knot here. 
trefoil knot diagram. And in the second closure, uh, which is to close the endpoints with an embedded arc again, but this time we just assume that the closure arc is going under everything it meets, then it will change the resulting knot type. And you can easily see that this diagram is equivalent to the unknot. You have a uh, Rydermeister 2 move available here, and then Rydermeister 1 will undo this diagram. So uh, as soon as we just declare uh, the closure type, either with an underpassing arc or an overpassing arc, we have a well-defined connection, well-defined mapping from the set of notoids in the two sphere uh, to the set of classical knots. So these closures are giving us some uh, function in between um, two sets. And what we can obtain from these closures, of course, I mean, uh, many or essential structure or essential combinatorial information can be lost during the um, connection. As you see, I mean, we have a two crossing diagram in the beginning, then we close it, we just create one more crossing. And in the second closure, we either even lose the non-triviality of the diagram. I mean, we have something uh, trivial in the end by closing it. So, uh, but what is good about these closures is you can just uh, choose one of them and say that if you have a complicated knot diagram, you can just delete one of the underpassings that is possibly very long, that is uh, containing too, much, too many crossings on it, so that you obtain a knotted diagram from a classical knot diagram. And you can do, or you can compute the knot invariance that is assigned to the knot diagram via the knotted representation of the knot. So it reduces the number of the crossings from a very complicated complex knot diagram, and it easiest uh, the computation of uh, knot invariance. But for this, you need to show that the notoid representation will give the same result or value for the invariant as its closure. For example, um, not group uh, is one of the examples. You can define a combinatorial notoid group. And uh, the notoid representation of the knot will have the same notoid group with its closure uh, in the end. I mean, in the closure, you just calculate the knot group. And these are, uh, for example, knot group is a topological uh, invariant that is giving the fundamental group of the complement of the knot in three space, but it has a combinatorial description uh, that you can find via a representation. And this combinatorial representation is highly depending on the number of crossings because each crossing will give you a relation. So by reducing the number of crossings from the knot diagram and turning it into a netoid diagram, um, it eases the knot group computation, for example. So, or uh, there are some estimations, for example, cipher genus, uh, genus of a knot. It is the minimal genus of the surface that is bound by a knot type. So there are some estimations for this genus and uh, you can uh, give a better or finer estimation by using the notary representation uh, of the knot group because this estimation is in the end depending on the number of crossings. So reducing the number of crossings can really gives us some uh, better estimations for not invariants uh, that is valid for the closure of the notoid. So I mean this is the passage from uh, the from uh, by um, between these two theories, notoid theory and uh, classical knot theory. And uh, there is another passage uh, to the knot world, closed knot world, and uh, this is done by the virtual crossing. By the way, uh, do you hear me? Okay because maybe my internet is unstable. I can ch change the connection, please warn me. So this virtual closure is just, you have the two endpoints uh, in a not notoid diagram, and you again connect the endpoints with an embedded arc, but whenever you meet with a, a strand of the existing notoid diagram, you create um, a virtual crossing. A virtual crossing is not a real crossing, as uh, here in the above picture, but it's just a representation of what's going on uh, for a link uh, embedded in a um, thickened surface. So here I will explain it. So when you close uh, the notoid diagram in this way by creating virtual cr crossings, I mean, uh, these are not re really self uh, intersections of the diagram. And you can just attach a handle to the sphere of the diagram, of the knot diagram, notoid diagram, by just holding the connecting arc, 
like we see in the right hand side of the picture, so that your representation or your closed knot, knot diagram is lying in the torus. By this red arc, connecting arc is just uh, passing behind the arc, uh, behind the handle of the torus. So here is a more concrete example in the below picture. We see two notoid diagrams different than each other. Actually, we need to prove it that they are not um, deformable to each other by Rademeister moves, but we know that. Let's assume that. And by closing the endpoints of these two different uh, notoid diagrams, we obtain the same virtual knot. So this knot diagram here, it's the immersed circle in the plane with two real crossings and with one virtual crossing. And we can represent this picture here in the torus in this way. So here you see the virtual crossing is just a representation of what's going on here. Uh, so the arc is just going uh, front of the handle and then some part is going uh, behind of the handle, let's say. And there is no meeting in the torus uh, between these arcs. There is no intersection, but uh, it is like represent representing uh, non-planar graphs uh, in the plane. So when you try to represent or when you try to uh, work with uh, links um, that is represented in the surface in the plane that you can do that, you need to put here a virtual crossing to just uh, know what's going on in the surface, in the corresponding surface. So this theory is uh, invented or discovered or introduced, whatever we say, by Lou Kaufman in the end of uh, 90s. And... Um, Virtual knot theory is considered up to, I mean, virtual knot theory is just uh, the theory of knots and links uh, in the thickened surfaces of some genus, of arbitrary genus, taken up to rhydomycin moves, homeomorphisms of the surfaces, and also stabilization moves. That is, we can cut out some extra genus if it doesn't contain enough the part of the knot. So it is not really sticking on one uh, fixed gene surface, but for example, this diagram will be stably equivalent uh, to uh, genus two torus diagram. You can add um, as, much, as many uh, as genus you want to the torus. They will be considered as equivalent. Uh, so after, I mean, I'm just keeping this part very fastly. So we introduced these two closures and what we can obtain uh, from this virtual closure, of course, I mean, it's a well-defined map from the set of notoids to the set of uh, virtual knots. And there are many invariants defined for virtual knots. It's a well-defined map, so we can use the invariants of virtual knots for notoid diagrams or for notoid theory. So we can gain some uh, tools, tools by this well-defined map. But as you see, it's not a one-to-one uh, -one map. I mean, two different uh, notoid types are closing to the same uh, virtual knot, which is something not very bad in terms of uh, defining invariants, but still, I mean, it's not really strong. So a very fast uh, description of virtual knot theory. And after that, I mean, as I said in the beginning again, I mean, notoids and notoid diagrams are combinatorial objects defined in the two dimensional spaces, surfaces, plane, two sphere, whatever. But we can describe them uh, as space curves, open curves, open smooth curves embedded in a three dimensional space, but with some restriction. So when we consider a closed uh, curve in the three-dimensional space, embedded curve that is a knot, we consider ambient isotopy, a relation that is the continuous deformation of the space deforming our knot. We consider our, our knot to be a rubber and it is deformed under ambient isotopy, that is the isotopy of the three-dimensional space. Here we have this open curve uh, that is not intersecting itself. Uh, and to just obtain the notoid equivalence, uh, remember, we just uh, forbid the passings or pullings or pushings of the endpoints through strands. So we really think them not fixed. They can be moved, shifted uh, in their regions, or they can be replaced by some other Rydermeister moves happening in some other places, but we are not really forcing them to move uh, out of their regions. So to just uh, obtain this equivalence relation, we need to consider a corresponding uh, relation in three-dimensional space. We consider our space curve with two endpoints uh, attached in uh, two lines, two parallel lines. And these two parallel lines are just uh, 
orthogonal to the plane of the diagram. Here is a notary diagram, and we consider these two, uh, the pair of parallel lines passing through the endpoints. And we lift our notary diagram in the three-dimensional space to obtain the space curve. And we just allow the ambient diisotopy of the three-dimensional space in the complement of these uh, two lines. So the endpoints are really fixed there. They are just able to move along the vertically along the endpoints, uh, along the lines, sorry. And we can deform as much as we can uh, our space curve uh, in the complement. If you consider this as two parallel tubes, you just uh, delete these tubes from the three-dimensional space and the deformation is happening in the complement of these tubes. So for example, here we can't really pull out this endpoint through this uh, line. So there's this restriction. So we proved in our very first uh, paper in 2017, uh, notoids in a plane are just in one-to-one -one correspondence with line isotopy, this restricted uh, isotopy type of uh, line isotopy classes of space curves. Or I mean, conversely, we can just, um, in the opposite direction, we can show that if we have a space curve, we can determine two parallel lines. We can choose two parallel lines passing through its endpoints, and we can determine the plane uh, that these lines are orthogonal to, and we can project our space curve to that plane so that we obtain a notary diagram in that plane. So here we see, for example, two directions uh, of projections uh, for the same space curve, and the notary type can be changing drastically. Here we see a notary diagram with two crossings, um, the projection to the xy plane, let's say, and to the other plane, we see just a trivial uh, diagram. So it's really important the choice of uh, projection direction to choose these parallel lines. And as long as you determine these two parallel lines, you consider your space curve, end up with these two parallel lines, and then uh, it corresponds to a notary diagram. So there is this passage also. And we can consider this as a 3D interpretation of uh, notary lying in the plane. And what was good, I mean, we defined this uh, interpretation, we introduced this interpretation, it was something not very, I mean, it is intuitive, right? I mean, you just need to consider what is corresponding to notoid equivalence in the plane. I mean, we, we can't consider a space curve moving freely, but the endpoints are attached in this on these tubes and they are not really freely moving, just uh, maybe upside down, uh, I mean, up and down, they can move. Uh, the good thing was, I mean, we could use, we, we were able to use this interpretation in an applied area, which is very good for us, for pure mathematicians, because all the fundings and stuff are coming with this uh, application stuff. So uh, here we see a cartoon of a protein, actually, in a cell. I don't remember the name. I mean, the uh, protein was taken from protein data bank. You can check from our paper which pa protein is this, but it's a cartoon type. So a protein chain in the cell is just, uh, it, it can be considered as a space curve um, with two endpoints here. These two black dots are the endpoints of the chain, of the protein um, of the protein chain. And in 80s, people, are, uh, people um, decided to study protein chains uh, through their topological properties or geometric properties and what they found uh, as useful was the knot theory. So you have a space curve uh, lying in a three-dimensional environment, and you can choose a closure type, and you can connect down points of the protein chain by just simplifying the protein cha chain uh, with some algorithms. So here is the simplification of the protein chain. And in the second picture, if you look at the uh, picture below, you just connect the um, endpoints and what you obtain by its projection is a knot diagram. So knot invariants are there to detect the topological type of this closed protein chain. But as I just show you, while closing open curves in the space or in the two uh, space, in the three space or two space, it doesn't matter, you can lose the non-triviality or some essential information about the entanglement. Here, it was a non-trivial diagram, and I can prove you that it's a non-trivial notoid type in the beginning, but by closing it, you just obtain an unknot. So this closure uh, or closure idea and detecting the topological type or the topological properties of a protein chain or, or DNA uh, by a knot 
it was a very good idea because, I mean, in the end, it still works. I mean, there are so many functions defined for not to, nots, and it's still something to detect the topological property, but you can lose the information. So what we just proposed was to use the 3D interpretation of notoids. Now we have the notoid theory, just determine a projection direction for the protein chain. Uh, and this is determined by just choosing a pair of lines passing through the endpoints of the protein chain and project it to a plane that is orthogonal to the plane that is orthogonal to the uh, pair of lines that you choose. And the projection is a notoid diagram. And uh, we, we are trying to uh, develop or construct new uh, notoid invariants day by day by our research. And the topological type of the protein now can be detected by these polynomials or uh, notoid invariants that I will just show you. So this was a kind of success. And uh, we worked uh, with some people in Swiss uh, Bioinformatics Institute. Gunder Alis uh, was an ex-student of my PhD advisor, Sofia Lambrapoulou. Then he went there to ha have a postdoc there. And uh, uh, other mathematicians, mathematicians were very into biological applications of uh, mathematics, uh, especially not theory. And uh, yeah, they are applied mathematicians and we have this uh, work together, joint work. The idea is coming from our 3D interpretation and not the theory, and they just uh, did the competitions that we were very not very successful at. Uh, so yeah, it was a good application that I wanted to show you. Um, there are some more details, but I will just skip. So uh, again, I mean, referring to the first slide, uh, there are we can say that there are two types of notoids in the two sphere, and the first type is called not type notoids. That is actually these are notoids that have at least one representation with two endpoints in the same region. Here, for example, in the middle picture, we see the endpoints in different regions, but there is a rhizomycer two move that will undo this diagram and that will bring the endpoints in the same region. This is a not type notoid because it is the same with a knot. By closing it, it, it will be just a knot or you don't need to create any more combinatorial intersections or whatever. But on the right hand side, we see again a diagram with two endpoints in distinct regions, but it is actually a proper notoid that will have no representations with endpoints in the same region. It means that there is no Rydomyser move sequence that will deform this diagram to bring the endpoints in the same region. So we can classify notoids in two sets. Uh, not type notoids we have, this just represents, I mean, they are just open representations of classical knots and we have proper notoids that the theory starts to be extended. But how to show that a notoid is a proper notoid? So how to how do we know that we can't bring the endpoints in the same region? Because by direct attack, uh, it may be cumbersome. I mean, it can be difficult. So we improved some um, invariance that comes from um, virtual knot theory with Kaufman to detect the distance between the endpoints for the notoid type. For example, the affine index polynomial or the arrow polynomial, uh, I won't show you these, but these are some polynomials whose degrees or uh, some degrees in them uh, give some lower bound for the distance of the notoid type. So when you compute the arrow polynomial, for example, for this diagram, you will see there is a lambda uh, term that will exist in the polynomial and the degree will be one. So you will know that you can't really reduce this diagram to another uh, diagram that will have zero height, zero distance in between the endpoints. So these were the first part of the talk that I skipped a, a little bit quick because I mean, actually uh, these are old works. Now I will show you uh, my recent works, but maybe I should just get rid of this grace box anyway. So let me go back. So first, let's go back to very archaic, very ancient uh, not polynomial that we call Alexander polynomial. Maybe I should. OK, I should play with it a, a lot. So can you see the screen as a full screen? OK. Thanks. So uh, the Alexander polynomial was the first not polynomial in the history um, that was defined by James Alexander in 20s, 1928. Uh, and this is the publication place. And 
the, this polynomial gives some information, geometric information about knots and links, classical knots and links in three dimensional space. It is related to the fundamental group uh, of the complement of the knot, but it is a very nice combinatorial construction, uh, which was also given by Alexander in the same paper. So you see some portion of a oriented knot or a link diagram in this picture. So we are in a crossing, and at a crossing, we just uh, have the direction for the underpassing arc here. So it's directed upwards uh, with respect to the bottom to top direction of the plane that we see. So uh, the convention is the following. We just want to label two of the four local regions that is incident to this crossing or vertex, you can say. And the convention is when you go travel along the underpassing arc, uh, the left the left hand side regions, uh, which we see as A and B regions here, are dotted. We put a dot uh, for each of these regions. And the other uh, two regions are just left blank. And then we start to label these dotted regions first with X and minus X and the other regions by minus one and one. So this is the convention. So what we obtain by this labeling is, uh, if you label all the local regions of a diagram uh, with this convention, to each crossing, we have a system of uh, equations uh, coming from this labeling. So here, for this crossing, uh, for the first picture, we see that the corresponding equation is x times a, the name of the region that is labeled, minus x times b plus c minus d zero. So this is is there. Ahmed, maybe you should meet yourself. Thanks, sure, teacher. Okay, thanks. So uh, there is this relation coming uh, assigned to a crossing uh, of a knot or a link diagram. And as a whole, I show you a concrete example. Here's a trefoil knot diagram with an orientation on it. And we just label, uh, we just give names to the uh, five regions here, A, B, C, D, E. And we put dots with the convention that Alexander suggested. And then the system of equations that we obtain coming from each crossing is this, uh, the three relations. And of course, uh, we can represent this system of equations with a matrix, with a three times five, uh, three times five matrix, uh, where each row is determined by a crossing and columns are given by the regions. And we just, uh, put the labels of the equations for uh, as entries of this matrix. So here is the matrix that we obtain to represent what's going on with uh, out of this labeling. And of course, I mean, we want to have something nicer out of this rectangular uh, matrix. We can turn it to a square matrix by deleting two adjacent columns or two adjacent, uh, the columns corresponding to two adjacent regions in the diagram, for example, here, I delete A and B columns, and I obtain this nice smaller and square matrix whose determinant can be computed now. And Alexander says that my polynomial can be obtained with the determinant of the square matrix. And of course, it will matter uh, which um, the choice of adjacent regions that you are deleting from this matrix, but if the Alexander, uh, Alexander says that, Okay, uh, it can change, but it will change the polynomial that you find out of uh, by utilizing the determinant will be um, related to the other polynomial, the initial polynomial that you obtained by deleting some other uh, adjacent columns uh, up to a term given by x to the uh, some in, some integer power of x and with a sign. So all the polynomials that we can obtain from uh, by deleting um, two adjacent columns from this matrix uh, are, are related to each other by minus plus or minus uh, x to the n. Okay, so n is some integer. So that's why Alexander gives his polynomial by this strange equality sign. It's not really equality, but uh, up to some term given by the powers of x. And there's a sign uh, difference also. So this is really an ancient uh, not polynomial. Then in 60s, Conway gave a recursive way to compute this polynomial that I will show you. But then in 80s, uh, like 20 years later, 
Kaufman sat down and said, okay, how can I define this polynomial in a maybe, uh, again, with a determinant uh, idea, but with a state sum formulation. So he, he describes states of a, a knot diagram. Here we see the Trefoil knot diagram, but we just forget about the um, crossing types and we just consider the universe of the Trefoil knot diagram. That is the flat knot diagram, actually. And uh, what we do first to uh, star, put a star to two adjacent regions of this diagram. So here I choose uh, the exterior region and the adjacent region uh, to it uh, to just uh, assign stars. And then what I obtain is a universe or a flat diagram with three crossings and three uh, regions. So whenever I label uh, two adjacent regions, uh, on my knot diagram, I will have an equivalence for the four valent vertices for the number of four valent vertices and the regions of the universe. So I just delete uh, these adjacent regions and then the remaining regions are uh, labeled or assigned with a marker, state marker. Here we see them as black holes or not black holes, but black uh, markers. And the rule to mark a region is uh, a region is marked with a black spot uh, at the crossing that is in the boundary of the region. So for example, for the region C, we can put the marker uh, at the first crossing or the second crossing uh, as we see in the other states. But here is just one possibility that the C is marked at the crossing one, E is crossing at the crossing two, and D is uh, marked at the crossing three. Okay, and in the second state of this universe, of the very same universe, C is marked with one uh, at one at the first crossing, and D is marked at the second crossing, and E is marked at the third crossing, and so on. So there are three possible markings of this universe uh, where the number of uh, four valent vertices is equal to the number of uh, number of regions or faces of the universe. And what is nice about this state uh, idea? So here, uh, just below the blue box, I have the uh, expansion for the determinant. I mean, this is M is a square matrix, and we can give the formula of the determinant in this way, right? I mean, it is the sum of the products of uh, terms, uh, entries of the matrices, and uh, we just take the product uh, given by some uh, permutation sigma in SN, uh, where N is the size uh, of the matrix. Okay, so this is the expansion formula. And what we see from uh, this formula is that each product in the summation is just a choice of each column in the corresponding matrix of a row. So each column is choosing a row and each row is chosen exactly once and you obtain the determinant uh, terms as products and you sum them up to obtain the determinant. And here, what we see about these states is that, uh, I mean, converting this determinant expansion uh, to the knot diagram or the link diagram, it means that, remember that in the matrix that Alexander was suggesting, each column was given by regions and each row was given by crossings. And I say that in the determinant expansion, we see the products are corresponding to a choice of um, each region, uh, a row, exactly one row. So it means that in the not theoretical sense, each region here in the universe is choosing one uh, crossing. Okay, one row corresponds to a crossing. So, and the non trivial terms for this uh, product and the summation in them for the determinant formula for the Alexander polynomial will give from the choices of regions uh, of some crossings that lie in the boundary of these regions. So if C, I mean, there is no possibility that C chooses the third crossing. There is no coincidence. It's not, they are not incident. So C can uh, choose either one or two. So this will correspond to a non-trivial uh, term in the product of the determinant. So here we see the matrices corresponding to these states. And for example, we see in these matrices, the first cross, the C uh, region is choosing one. These choosing the third crossing and uh, these 
sorry, is choosing the second crossing and so on. So there are three products, uh, non-trivial products for the determinant, for the corresponding determinant of the, uh, that, give, that will give us the Alexander polynomial. It means that states that are described in this way are in one-to-one -one correspondence with non-zero determinant terms of the Alexander polynomial. So Kaufman said, done, that's nice. I mean, I, can, I don't need to use uh, matrices anymore. I can define the Alexander polynomial with a summation over states. And uh, we sum up the weights of each state. For example, in the last line, we see the first state is weighted as minus x one times minus one. It's the product of labels that the markers are showing us in, with respect to the convention of the Alexander. So for example, from this state, it, uh, the contribution is x, and we need to consider also the sign of the uh, state s to just uh, obtain the sign of the permutation in the determinant summation. And sign of the state is given by minus one to the power of number of black holes in the state S. And the black hole is just a state marker that we see on the right, on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, it is the state marker that is uh, placed um, in the quadrant of this picture, uh, which the strands or the arcs are going inward. Okay, so this is the black hole uh, state marker for us. If you see this trefoil state here, there is just one black hole. This means that the sign of the state is minus one and it will contribute to the polynomial done minus one times X, which is uh, that we see here. And in the second uh, state, we see that the contribution is plus one and there is no black hole here. There is no marker in the state uh, that lies uh, in the quadrant of the inward going arcs. So it's uh, the number of black holes is zero, the sign is uh, one, and then the contribution is uh, plus one. And in the last state, the contribution is minus x times minus x, x squared, uh, and uh, there is no black, uh, no, there is one black hole here, and the other one is the second crossing. So the sign is plus one, and we obtain the same uh, polynomial as we did in the beginning with the uh, original construction of the Alexander uh, polynomial. So this is a nice reformulation of the Alexander polynomial. Uh, and there's another interesting uh, construction of the Alexander polynomial that we call Conway, Alexander Conway polynomial. Actually, Conway uh, rediscovered the Alexander polynomial in the end of 60s by using a recursive relation. And the recursive relation that I will show you is working um, by using uh, some relation that we call skin relation over three different link diagrams that we see locally here. So L plus diagram is a link diagram that is the same with L minus and L zero out of this picture in the rest of the diagram, but it differs from L minus at this crossing just. So we see a positive crossing here with respect to the right hand row. But in L minus, it is the same with L plus, but it just differs from L plus uh, at this crossing, and it's a negative crossing with respect to uh, the right hand rule. We can resolve this crossing to obtain L0. Again, this, these are representations of three different link diagrams or not diagrams, and they just differ at one crossing point. The rest of the diagrams are the same, they correspond. And Conway is just, just defined a polynomial uh, out of this, uh, out of a relation that he gives. First of all, let me show you the third relation. He just says that, okay, my polynomial that I will show you with Adele uh, will have this relation in between these three link diagrams that differ from each other locally at just one crossing. So it says that my polynomial or let's say Conway polynomial or the potential polynomial, he calls it, the potential polynomial of L plus minus the potential polynomial of L minus is equal to Z times the potential polynomial of L zero, the link diagram that we obtain by resolving the crossing in the oriented way. So by using this and the first two axioms here, he says that the potential function can be calculated. And the first axiom is the thing that we want if K is 
and being isotopic to K prime. These are not diagrams or link diagrams oriented. If they are equivalent uh, structures or objects, I want the potential functions to coincide. If uh, K is the unknot or equivalent to unknot, uh, the polynomial will give you uh, will give us the value one, and we have this uh, skin relation. So by using just these uh, three axioms, uh, the polynomial that he was introducing can be computed recursively. Uh, but then he he just noticed that in the same paper that it is nothing but the Alexander polynomial that was defined 40 years ago because the Alexander polynomial also satisfies this local skin relation he shows. Um, and there is this correspondence, the potential function uh, when you make the substitution for the um, variable z, z minus z inverse, when you substitute z with z minus z inverse, you have the Alexander polynomial of the same knot uh, with the variable z square. So there, there is this passage in between these two polynomials, they are the same polynomial, we can say. They, they are just obtained from each other by a substitution. So, uh, our question with Kaufman was, how can we extend uh, the Alexander Conway polynomial to multi-notoids? So we have a generalized structure now. Uh, they are not classical knots, so they can be proper diagrams or proper uh, types. So how can we extend it? So the recursive uh, relation or the recursion that the Alexander Conway polynomial uh, is described with stops at a finite step since any ascending link diagram is MB isotopic to the unknot. So this means that when we just uh, consider a flat knot diagram, we can just arrange the crossings, organize the crossing so that the diagram is ascending. So it means that whenever you meet a crossing the first time, it will be going under. So here, you, this is your starting point, and you meet with this crossing, it goes under, the second meeting uh, of the same strand with some other strand going under, under, and then the, in the second passage, it starts to go over. So if you consider this diagram embedded in the three-dimensional space, it's like our spiral toys that we played when we were kids. It, it is just the trivial uh, closed space curve. So any ascending knot diagram or link diagram is just unknot for us. And we can Mm, we can change a given knot or link diagram to an ascending link diagram by making crossing changes, by changing the crossing from over to under. We drastically change the topological type of the knot, but we can turn it combinatorial to an unknot diagram. But for multi notoids, it's not possible, we notice. So here, these are two small and simple multi notoid diagrams with two components, right? There is a circle component. Uh, it's not even nodded on that component. There is a line segment here. Uh, but, and there is a one crossing shared by these two components. Uh, if you consider a starting point, you can consider this diagram as a sending diagram. But unfortunately, this doesn't fall back to a trivial multi notoid diagram with no crossings. Because when, when you change the crossing type, you have this L minus, and you have this crossing here also. And there is no ambient isotope or iridomycer move that will delete this crossing here. We can't just pull uh, the endpoint out of the circle. And your recursion, when you start applying the Conway's uh, recursion, the third relation, you will just go uh, in a loop. Uh, from L plus to L minus, L minus to L plus. But in the classical knot uh, version, I mean, uh, in, for classical knots, since we have closed knots, closed curves or uh, links, uh, since we have any ascending link diagrams and being isotopic to the on knot, the recursion will stop when we have on knots and the on knot value is determined by the second axiom. So we just make the substitution, the second uh, coming from the second axiom, and we know that whatever link diagram we start by changing its crossing to minus or resolving it, we will have on nuts or on links and we know their uh, values. So Conway Alexander polynomial can be computed in this way. But for multi notoids even for the simple one, we will go from L plus to L minus, L minus to L plus, and the recursion will not end. So we did a big detour 
to obtain the Conway Alexander polynomial for multi notoids actually, we needed to see our notoids or multi notoids in an um, extended category. It is strange, but uh, unfortunately, it is true. So we see another diagram again here, a very nice one with two crossings in a plane, and it is arranged in a, a special way. So this notary diagram can be considered as endowed with a height function in the Morse form. And this height function has a finite number of critical points that is a, a, minimum, a minimum point or an end point or a maximum point or a crossing point. So in other words, we can slice this uh, notoid diagram into horizontal uh, slices so that in each horizontal slice we see a um, we see a cup or a crossing or an endpoint strand or a cap. So we can just slice this diagram into elementary tangles that we can read off. Uh, and this diagram can be considered as the product of these elementary tangles. And uh, with this interpretation, uh, we just assume the tangent directions at the end points are fixed. And uh, I mean, we don't want to add cups and caps by creating some, by some rotation of the end points. So they are fixed there, uh, lying in uh, vertical strands. And we can deform more notoid diagrams as long as they don't add or delete caps and cups, but we can uh, only delete a cup and a cap uh, if they're sequentially following each other, uh, like in this picture. In the first picture, we see uh, a cap and a cup is following each other, and it is planarized that we just to correct or just to turn this uh, piece of strand into a straight uh, line segment, right? So this is our, uh, our mean max move. So we assume this move uh, on Morse isotope, uh, for our Morse isotopy relation. Or we can just change the uh, placement of the elementary tangle, the crossing elementary tangle, with respect to a maximum or minimum, or cap and the cap. And these are slide moves for us. And we have the vertical moves, uh, vertical Rydermeister move uh, two and three for Morse more size of the relation, sorry. And uh, these are just the Rydermeister moves from classical knot theory, uh, but uh, in the vertical um, arrangement. And we have this endpoint uh, isotopies also that shift standpoints vertically with respect to uh, another critical point, with respect to a cap and a cup or a, a crossing point, or they can be shifted within, uh, I mean, with respect to each other, they can be displaced with respect to each other, as we see in the last picture. But we don't want to add any cups and caps to the endpoints. So when you consider Morse notoids, uh, specially arranged diagrams in the plane, we consider we start to consider this uh, isotope relation um, among us, among them. Uh, do I have time, by the way? So maybe I should just be faster. Um, uh, you have 10 more minutes. OK, thanks. So we uh, just assume this uh, isotope relation for Morse notoid diagrams. And this is the very just this is just very simple uh, Morse isotopy invariant defined for Morse notoids, and this is the rotation number that is given by the half of the uh, half of the sum of the signs on the maximum and minimum of the diagram. So we have orientation on our diagram. So a clockwise oriented uh, cap or cup is signed uh, to minus one, or a counterclockwise uh, oriented cup and the cap. The elementary tangles are signed to one, and we just sum them up uh, in the given diagram. Uh, and take the half of it, and we obtain the rotation number for that uh, notoid class, for the Morse notoid class. And then, okay, so we just uh, approach to our diagrams in the Morse form. What is good about that is that now we can just create an um, extended tangle category, or we can just understand our diagrams as morphisms in a tangle category. So in this tangle category, our objects are natural numbers, and morphisms are our elementary tangles. Here is the, uh, ele um, uh, sorry, identity strand. It is the identity morphism from one to one. And here is the cap, the elementary tangle, and we see it as a morphism from two to zero, from two to vacuum. And we see a, a cap, uh, cap, sorry, and it is um, a morphism from zero to two. 
And we have these braiding morphisms also uh, that are morphisms from two to itself. And we define the composition by just uh, joining the free ends of two uh, elementary tangles together or elementary morphisms by just joining uh, them together. And we obtain, for example, here, uh, the composed morphism from two to zero obtained by the uh, composition of the crossing and the cap. And we have the tensor product that is to stack these elementary tangles next to each other. Here we see a morphism from four to two. And this gives us a braided monoidal category with uh, braiding maps given by this crossing uh, morphisms. Uh, there are some details here to be shown, but I just skip. But uh, we can see whenever we consider our diagrams in the Morse form, we just uh, relate our elementary tangles to morphisms of some category with nature numbers objects. Okay, and then we can define a factor from this element uh, extended tangle category to the matrix category by just inserting, substituting dots to the free ends of each elementary tangle in the diagram. So we slice uh, horizontally our diagram. And for example, here, we just assign I and J indices chosen from some index set I, and we just label our diagrams or the free ends of the elementary morphisms with some indices, okay? So this will provide us to see each elementary morphism as a matrix element. So here we see a cap assigned, uh, endowed with indices I and J, uh, will give the entry of a matrix M uh, corresponding to the I and J uh, entry of the matrix M. Or a cup will give another, uh, maybe not the same matrix, but another matrix uh, entry corresponding to these uh, indices. And crossing morphisms also, uh, they, will just correspond, they will just correspond to matrix elements when they are indexed by some elements, okay? And uh, the identity strand here indexed by NJ, they will, it will correspond to Kronecker delta. So it will give us the identity matrix. And we have this um, morphisms starting or ending at uh, the endpoints of the notoid diagram. When we fix an index for the red points, the endpoints of the diagram, uh, they behave as uh, Kronecker deltas, like the identity uh, strands. Anyway, so when, since we shift to another category from the tangle category, now we have matrix uh, category, we need to transform our topological moves that we considered for Morse diagrams to matrix form. So for example, mean and max move here is just to correct this uh, uh, wavy strand to the identity strand. And when we read off uh, as matrix elements corresponding uh, after indexing the strand, uh, free ends, we obtain that uh, the cup and the cap matrix elements will have to cancel each other. In the end, we will have Kronecker delta. So uh, the matrices that we will choose to correspond to uh, maximum and minima morphisms or cap and cup morphisms uh, need to be inverses to each other. And from uh, the Rydermeister 2 move, we see that the matrices that we can assign for the crossing morphisms should be also inverses to each other because of this topological move. They need to be canceling each other and turning into one uh, by multiplying them. Or uh, we have these mixed moves with R and M uh, entries from the slide moves. And we have the third move here that will correspond to Jan Baxter equation of the statistical mechanics. So we have uh, the Morse notoid diagram. We shifted to a composition or multiplication of matrix elements. So we read uh, our diagram as the product of uh, matrix elements. And these matrices need to satisfy the Young-Baxter equation. And we have some invariants that are uh, constructed in this way via matrices that will satisfy this property Young-Baxter. They need to, because we need to have the topological identity, vertical Rydermeister tree. Uh, and we call these uh, invariants quantum invariants of notoids, since, I mean, it, they satisfy the Young-Baxter equation. And they are, the invariants are given as a partition function from internal states. I mean, as they, they are given as products of internal states of a diagram, and we sum up all the possible internal states. 
I will show you an example. It's too much abstract, but the motivation is coming from this uh, equation, and it's an equation of statistical mechanics. That's why we call the invariance quantum invariance. So now I will show you a quantum way to construct the Conway Alexander polynomial or Alexander Conway. It's better to say it that way. So we see a crossing of a oriented not or a link diagram or a notoid diagram or a multi notoid diagram here. It is just a positive crossing in the above picture and a negative crossing in the below picture. And we expand this uh, crossing either by resolving it by um, following up the orientation in the con uh, oriented way, or we replace this crossing by a vertex. And we do this with respect to the uh, possible indexing of the endpoints. Suppose that our index set is just containing two elements, plus one and minus one, and there are uh, four ways to possible the endpoints, right? Plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, and so on. And when the endpoints are, for example, uh, labeled by plus, 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 we obtain the second resolution of the crossing when we resolve it, uh, and the usual strands here without any crossing are Kronecker deltas, and it takes a coefficient q just uh, in front. And when uh, the endpoints of the crossing morphism here are indexed by plus minus, we have this coefficient for this resolution, and for minus minus uh, indexing, we have q to the minus one, and when we have the opposite uh, indexing for the free ends of this crossing morphism, we just have one as the coefficient of this replacement of the crossing, okay? And we have this uh, expansion for the negative crossing as well. It's not the same uh, kind of you replace Q with Q minus, Q to the minus one, and you obtain this uh, expansion for the negative crossing. So what we obtain with this? So when you consider this morphism, uh, the braiding morphism or the crossing morphism as a matrix, with possible uh, indexing at the free ends, you obtain this four by four matrix, whose entries are just coefficients of this resolution and replacement. Here is an example when it is indexed by plus, 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 we obtain the first entry of this R matrix Q, because in the resolution we say that it will take Q. And we can show that these uh, two matrices, R and R minus, that will correspond to positive and negative uh, crossing morphisms. Uh, they will satisfy the young baxter equation. I'm not showing it to you, but we obtain these matrices that corresponds to an elementary uh, crossing morphism. And we, of course, have the cups and caps morphisms as well. Uh, we need to choose some, matrix, uh, some matrices for them as well. And I choose uh, the matrix, for example, for the uh, cap uh, with in the indices at the endpoints plus and plus. Uh, its orientation is clockwise or counterclockwise, I guess. I can't see it clockwise, I guess. I can't see it with, because of this black box that I can't displace anyway. So in the end, uh, these cups and caps uh, morphisms are assigned to I, uh, the complex number I, to the label or indexing on the uh, morphism times the rotation number of this morphism. So here we see squared of minus i and squared of i, blah, blah. And we obtain these two by two matrices for cups and caps morphisms. So we just translate everything to matrix uh, language. And they are two by two because, for example, plus and minus indexing is just zero for this uh, morphism. And there are two endpoints for these morphisms, three ends. Anyway, so what I obtain with this uh, here, for example, there's a um, trivial strand with endpoints uh, indexed by plus plus, and it will be assigned to I. So we start to read off um, our state components uh, as some powers of I. In the end, I will have this uh, state sum polynomial for the Morse notoid uh, K, for the Morse notoid diagram K. So here, the bracket K sigma is the Mm, product of the coefficients that correspond to the state uh, state components. That, I mean, it's the product of the coefficients of the state components 
in sigma. And here, i to the norm of sigma. Norm of sigma is just the sum of labels of loop components in sigma and the long segment component in the state sigma multiplied by the rotation number assigned by the components. So here's an example, maybe better. It is just the unknot, not even a not to it. So there are two states for it, indexed by plus and minus, and these are corresponding to minus i and i. So the value of the unknot is zero with this state sum uh, polynomial or the value of this uh, trivial notoid Morse notoid diagram is I. Anyway, so I have to say here that data tilde here, uh, we obtain a polynomial by just multiplying the coefficients that we have uh, from the expansions of the crossings. Uh, it is just corresponding to one possible indexing of the endpoint of the notoid diagram K. So you start indexing the endpoints of K with plus plus or plus minus minus plus or minus minus and then you index the internal uh, free ends of the elementary tangles and you sum up the products of the corresponding uh, matrix uh, elements and since there are four possible indexing of the endpoints uh, for k this data prime or data theta is actually giving us a two by two matrix so it's a matrix uh, invariant of Morse notoid diagrams for us. It is not just a one polynomial. So from each possible indexing of the endpoints of the notoid diagram, we will have an entry of a matrix. So and this uh, state sum uh, is just satisfying the Conway scan identity, and it is just uh, obtained by side by subtraction of the uh, expansion of the crossings. Here we see that. The polynomial of the positive crossing uh, diagram minus the polynomial of the negative crossing diagram is just the a coefficient, a term multiplied by the polynomial of the resolution of the crossing diagram. So we just uh, constructed the Conway Alexander polynomial for more, uh, Morse um, notoids. And it is not an invariant, uh, a fully invariant. Here is a Rydomeister one move, and we see how it changes. It adds a term with uh, minus qi uh, to the trivial strand by, uh, I mean, by applying this move, we change the polynomial, but we can normalize the polynomial by just multiplying it with uh, iq to the rotation number of k, the total number of rotations. And then, as I said, this is a matrix and we can check its trace. So it's a square matrix depending on the uh, labeling of the endpoints of k. And we can compute its trace. It will give the uh, give us some polynomial, one unique polynomial actually, not a matrix anymore. And we will assume the Alexander Conway polynomial for our notoid diagram. This the trace of this matrix actually with some uh, normalization with the rotation number. So here is an example. I will show you quickly. So here is the problematic, uh, very simple multi notoid diagram that I showed you before. I couldn't compute uh, the Alexander polynomial for it by using the um, skin relation. But here are the all possible states of this diagram by possible uh, indexing of the endpoints, endpoints plus plus, minus minus, minus minus, and plus plus. There are four states. And I just uh, substitute here the coefficients of it. And then I obtain the values of these open segment components. The first one is i, the rotation number is here. Uh, plus one, the label is one, i to the one, and then i to the minus one here, etc. So I just sum them up, q times i minus q inverse times minus i, etc. to obtain the Conway Alexander polynomial for this multi notoid It is just corresponding to the trace of this two by two matrix. Actually, these entries are just polynomials uh, that are obtained by just choosing a fixed labeling for the endpoints, plus plus, minus minus, etc. Okay, uh, and I, I mean state summation is corresponding to the trace of this matrix. So what we are uh, working now, uh, let me show you finally, this is the last slide. So we are trying to generalize the uh, start universe idea for the construction of the Alexander polynomial. So in the construction, remember that we just put stars in adjacent regions, so we just generalize it we just choose two regions here that are not adjacent to each other that do not share an h and i just decide to start them and the remaining regions are marked 
at uh, crossings in the boundary. But for neutral diagrams, I need to put a star at some arbitrary region because the number of four valent vertices is always one less than the number of crossings. So I need to delete one crossing to obtain a square uh, matrix to correspond to this. Uh, if we have a linkoid with two components, we don't need to delete everything, uh, anything. We don't need to have uh, any start uh, region assumption because it will be always true that the number of vertices is equal to the number of regions here. And if we have links or nodes in, uh, embedded in some torus, in some cases, we have that the number of crossings or valent vertices or is equal to the number of uh, disk regions. And we can just apply the state some formula for these universes. So uh, we are working on this and we call these uh, polynomials that we obtain out of these start universes or unstart universes, but with state some formula that I showed you, mock Alexander polynomials. Uh, they are not actually the, giving us Alexander polynomial, the classical one, because we are varying or variating the placement of uh, stars or we are not even considering stars in some universes. So that's why we call them mock. But uh, for the case where a notoid diagram, for example, takes a star in the exterior region, we are wondering about the relation of it, the state sum polynomial corresponding to this universe with the quantum uh, description of the Alexander Conway polynomial. I mean, we couldn't see what is the relation in between the polynomial that we obtain by just summing up the contribution, contributions of the uh, start universes for this Natoid diagram. And we can compute the Convey Alexander polynomial in the quantum way for this same Natoid. We are trying to search the relation. And also, uh, I will show you something. Maybe I should skip. Yeah, this is also ongoing research. Uh, I mean, there is. Uh, homology invariant of knots that we call knot floor homology that was defined not very, it's not an old uh, invariant, it's a recent one, let's say, maybe 15 years. It is defined by Oswald and Sabo, and it is the categorification of the Alexander polynomial. And then knot floor homology was shown to be obtained by utilizing the states of Kaufman that he gave for Alexander Conway polynomial that I just showed you by using the state markers. And this construction of not floor homology or the relation of this homology invariant by the states was given by Baldwin and Levine. Then we say that then let's generalize the not floor homology by using states uh, to notoids. And uh, we are trying to understand this paper. It is quite technical and complicated. And maybe some of the participants know that this papers about homology invariants and not floor homologies are kind of technical and very long or hard to understand. So we are trying to read the Baldwin and Levine paper and try to generalize the structures, notoids and multi notoids So that's the end of my talk. Sorry if I, I am a bit slow or whatever. It took a lot of time, I guess. And these are the references if you are curious about the papers. Uh, Nisrihan, thank you very much for your very nice talk. Let's take <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so any questions or comments? Uh, actually, I wrote a question. Uh, I'm in the library of this. Um, uh, um, why is it important to find an embedding too close to uh, knoids into one? Um, I don't know about not, not very much, but why is it important to close the notary diagram? You ask. Um, I I guess so. Uh, yes. Uh, you mean this slide, right? Actually, uh, yes, I mean this slide. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, to relate the theory of notuits to classical knot theory, actually, classical knot theory is still having some open problems or some curious problems that are some um, hot topic research on it. So, and notary theory is just uh, recently defined uh, and mainly by defining this closure, as I said, I mean, you can consider first a knot diagram, a closed curve in the three dimensional space, 
take its uh, projection, it's a knot diagram or a link diagram. And you can delete a very long arc from it if it just contains overpassing crossings on it. You, I mean, by just deleting one arc, you can get rid of a number of crossings from that diagram. And you are reducing to the case of a notoid diagram, right? You have a knot diagram, see this picture, you just delete this red arc, you reduce one crossing, and you are uh, having a notoid diagram, right? And Troy in his paper shows that, look, I mean, for example, I want to compute the knot group of this uh, knot, which is the trefoil knot, and it corresponds to the fundamental group of the complement of the knot in three dimensional space. But it is a combinatorial description by depending on the number of crossings of the representation. And in this representation, I have three crossings. But if I delete this crossing, I will reduce to two crossings. It will be a simpler representation of the knot. Okay. And I can compute the knot group on this representation in a simpler way. Since I reduce the number of crossings, it's the complexity of the computation is reducing. So one way to see the importance why we define these uh, closures is can be answered in this way. Or we have the invariant called the genus of a knot. It again, I mean, it is very hard to be found. It is not really easy to, uh, to be found, the genus of a knot. It is the genus of the surface that the knot bounds, but the minimal genus we want over the overall the surfaces that a knot can bound. So there is a way to construct that minimal genus surface over a knot diagram, but a knot has infinitely many diagrams, representations. So which one is minimal? Can we reduce one uh, surface genus uh, by using some other representation of the same knot by using some other diagram? Maybe from some other diagram, you obtain a more minimum, I mean, a fever genus surface bounded by the same knot. So this is an important problem and estimations are given um, depending on the number of crossings. And try says that, okay, don't compute, uh, don't find, or don't try to compute the genus uh, of the knot on the knot representation, but delete one arc and find the knotoid representation uh, of the knot. And you will, since you will have less crossings, it can give you a finer estimation. So, I mean, these are important aspects that the notoid theory helps classical knot theory problems. But you can also say, I, I don't want to work with classical knots. I want to work with these open strings in the plane or in the three-dimensional space. Uh, I want to obtain some invariants for them, tools to detect the type of uh, them. And you can say that, okay, let me close the endpoints and I have a classical knot diagram. I have invariants for them. I can use classical knot invariants for my knot, knotoid diagram, for my knotoid. You can do that. But as you see, I mean, closure is not really, it's a well-defined map, but it can essentially, I mean, the knotoid can essentially lose its structure. On the right-hand side, we close it, we turn it to a non-knot. When it is just a two-crossing knotoid diagram, it represents a non-trivial curve in the three-dimensional space. There are some invariants that can detect it, knotoid invariants. But when you close it, turn it into a classical knot diagram, and, uh, apply a classical knot invariant to this diagram, then you say that it is just trivial. So it is not really helpful or healthy way to construct things for knotoids. So this is not really important, but the important thing is by considering knotoid representations of knots that are obtained by deleting arcs from knot diagrams, they can easy some computations uh, for knot invariants or they can give better estimations. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, can any I more ask questions? a question yeah. too? Uh, is the extended tangle category you mentioned it, uh, just a monoidal category or does it keep the closed category uh, structure as well? Uh, I guess the matrix category keep the closed structure. The functor you have to define is also monoidal closed functor. Uh, I mean, I guess we don't need any special structure about equivalence of the extended tangle categories. Am I wrong? Uh, can you define the 
you just I mean, it's a braided monoidal category with the tensor well, product. Braided, uh, but not closed. Or closed. Closed? Not mm -hmm. uh, mm. What do you think about the closed structure in this uh, extended tangle categories? I mean, we are not really dealing with that, I guess. Hmm. Okay. I mean, the important thing for us to picture our diagrams in the category to have this factor to the matrix category. Just it's a very simple structure here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I thank you for the question. And I should admit that uh, I'm not very into category theory. So <laughs> it is just a tool for us to I mean, we just uh, lay back and see our diagrams in a categorical approach, but that's it. I mean, we are not going over and try to extract some invariance out of by using this category, by the, using some categories. There are some people doing that, but we didn't do it in our um, paper. Thank you for the comments. Any more questions or comments? So then maybe let me ask the uh, last question. In your last slide, you mentioned about Oswald Zabo uh, invariance as uh, not fair homology of knots and this categorifies the Alexander polynomial. And uh, your aim is as you have developed, uh, how shall I put it? Um, some quantum version of Alexander polynomial, let me say, or Alexander polynomial for notoids, you want to categorify uh, this, uh, your uh, polynomial so that it will be a generalization of uh, Oswald Zabo theory. Am I right? Am I, uh, did I understand correctly? Actually, it's right. It will be a generalization of this invariant to notoids. Since notoids set is just containing knots, it will right. be an expression. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so uh, we categorify that. I see. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you. Yes, but this generalization is not the categorification part. Uh -huh. uh, yes, it will. It may categorify the Alexander polynomial of notoids. Yes, it will generalize the knot plural homology to notoids. And we need right. to show that in this homology definition, we can extract the Alexander polynomial. We have to show that. I it's, see. I it's see. Really just a combinatorial uh, extension or generalization. It can be. We need I to see. see. We haven't done anything. But I need to say also that, I mean, we don't want to use the quantum model or quantum construction of the Alexander Conway polynomial for this uh, extension. We want to use our states with this. I see. Uh, I see. Start universes because it is very combinatorial. I mean, this is easy, right? I mean, the other right. thing, material, but the state summation, it, it is easy to understand. And Baldwin and Levine is just showing that the states are just in, are into, I'm mean, in one to one correspondence with the spanning trees of the dual graphs of knot diagrams. So there are some graph theoretical approaches there uh -huh. we are trying to understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, any more questions or comments? So let's thank our speaker once more. Thank you very much. Çok teşekkür ederim gerçekten de. Biz teşekkür ederiz. So I will stop the recording now. Maybe I should stop.